morning, everyone. All righty. Welcome, everyone, to Valparaiso Baptist Church. Will you stand and worship with us today uh, with He is Lord. And fortunately, we have uh, our projectors back today. Yay! Yay. Emptied of his glory, God became a man to walk through earth in ridicule and shame. A ruler yet a servant, a shepherd yet a lamb, a man of sorrows, agony and pain. He is Lord. Humbled and rejected, beaten and despised, upon the cross the Son of God was slain. Just like a lamb to slaughter, a sinless sacrifice, by his death his loss became our gain. He is Lord, he is Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan's forces crumble like a mighty wall. The stone that held him in was rolled away. The prince of life and glory was lifted over all. Now earth and heaven echo with the cry. He is Lord. You may be seated. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Um, we want to welcome everybody here that's here today. We want to welcome all of our visitors, those here and online. We do have um, welcome cards. <laughs> And we'd like you to fill out these visitor cards and turn them in at the front desk. And we also have a gift for you if you turn these in. You can also go to valpobaptist.org and you can fill, on the guest card, fill out the guest card there, submit prayer requests, and you can do your online tithing. Um, and we also have valpobaptist.churchtrack.com. Um, we are starting a uh, paper pantry for uh, toiletries and paper products to help give back to the community. And if you feel led to be a part of this ministry, there's a list of items up at the information desk. Um, Vacation Bible School is starting up July 19th to 23rd. <clears throat> Pre-registration is online now. You can go to valpobaptist.org or, or the valpobaptist.churchtrack.com. And I believe we still have these flyers up at the information desk. Um, it's the 19th to the 23rd, 5.30 to 8 p.m. in the evening. Um, Sunday school or small groups are starting up soon. If you want to become of a team and be a teacher, you can um, sign up at the information desk. Um, volunteers are going to be needed for a breakfast um, and dinner that we're providing for the Kentucky Mission Team that will be here from July 16th to the 31st, um, working on the Refuge Church with Eric Ford and Coutts. Um, Sign-up sheets for that are also at the information desk up front. Teens of Truth. On July 10th, from 10.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., there's going to be a pool party at the Bowers House. Um, come out for a time of swimming, and lunch is going to be provided. Also, Teens of Truth are going to the Porter County Fair July 24th. There's a concert for King and Country. 
Um, tickets are $23 a piece. You can RSVP with Kendra and Eli by July 1st, and that concert is 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, July 17th, there's going to be a disaster relief training offered for the Northwest Indiana Baptist Association. It will be hosted here at the church, and if interested, and you want to attend, uh, if interested, plan to attend, and the time will be determined. And we also have um, Daniel's Open House is going to be July 10th from 3 to 6 p.m. here at the church. And Vacation Bible School needs a few supplies. They need some Pringle cans, empty paper towel tubes, and then volunteers for the craft. And you can find Rhonda after the service if you want to help with that. All right, thank you.
All right. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And before we turn there, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's so good to be in your house. I love every week when we gather on Sundays as a church. Uh, because, Lord, it, it signifies a collective group of people all resounding the same praises to the God who is worth it. And so, Father, we're thankful for you being a God worthy of worship. And so, Lord, we bow before you today in humbled hearts and humbled uh, lives, uh, just presenting this service as a sacrifice to you. We pray, Lord, that you be with us and that, Lord, not only the meditations on our lips as we sung would be true in our hearts, but, Lord, as we open up our minds this morning to the Word of God and what it has to teach us, we pray that, Lord, you would help us to absorb the Word of God this morning. And if there be any wicked way within us, that, Lord, you would soften our hearts, help us to change and to mold into the people that you would have us to be. And so, Father, we love you and we thank you, and we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, picking up in verse 1, we're going to be um, entertaining a message that I've called worldly religion, worldly religion. Now, uh, it's awfully easy in life to spot a fake from the real deal, isn't it? It's so simple to do that, and that's true across the board. Matter of fact, I just experienced something like that this past week. This past week, I had a little bit of a scare with a cell phone purchase, all right, tragically, Kelly broke her phone at the beach. This is the first time ever that the beach betrayed Kelly. I think it's a sign. I think she goes there too much. Just... <laughs> so anyway, she's not having that. So apparently she needs to go to the beach more. But anyway, so after she dropped her phone at the beach, she cracked her screen. And so I was on the search for a phone for her. So I found this iPhone 11 that was being sold for $400, and the price seemed reasonable to me, especially with the age of the phone, so I made arrangements to pick up this phone, and I went out, and I bought it. But there was just one problem. The phone wouldn't transfer over to another carrier. Come to find out, as we called about this phone, we found out that the former owner still had a lease agreement on the phone. And so that's a no-no. If they're still paying off their phone, they can't go and sell the phone to somebody else. It doesn't work that way, right? And so thankfully, the guy was willing to refund me my money, but you got to remember, I didn't know this guy from Adam. And so I was at music rehearsal that night, so I called my good buddy Rick. Rick does just about anything because he's such a good friend. I mean, he really is. Greg is laughing because he knows it's true. Rick will do anything. So I'm like, Rick... I need you to go and pick up this money from this guy. I bought a phone. It's not working. But be on the lookout because it might be a fraud. I'm like, look to see if the money's counterfeit, you know? And so <laughs> I've given Rick these instructions. And poor Rick, you know, what does he have to defend himself but for his cane, you know? And I, that cane hurts, by the way, all right? <laughs> so anyway, he goes out there like a trooper, and he's on the lookout for this fraudulent money. And so I reminded Rick that when you get the envelope of money... Put the, the, the money up in the sunlight and look for the president on the right and the line or that strip on the left side. And so anyway, thanks be to God, everything was kosher. There was no issue. The guy wasn't trying to pull the wool over my eyes, and the, the money passed the test. But anyway, all that to say, if you put anything under a tad bit of scrutiny or a closer look, you can find out if it's the real deal or not, right? Right? And that's the point that I'm trying to make. From a distance, it might fool you. It might take the appearance of the real deal. But when you put it under a magnifying glass, it won't pass the credibility test. Well, come to find out, that's true of almost anything in life. It's true of money. It's true of fake watches. It's especially true of those veggie burgers. You know what I'm saying? That is not a burger. You cannot convince me that a veggie burger is a burger, okay? So anyway, all that to say, you can spot the real deal from the fake all day long. Well, the same is true of religion. I think an outside world can look in and they know whether or not our religion is worthless. And so Paul predicted that there would be a believer in the last days that would rise up and they would have what we're calling worldly religion. So we're going to take a look at that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I'll give you one more minute to turn there if you haven't done so already. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. All right, I don't hear any other pages going, so I'm going to assume you're there with me. Here we go. Verse 1 says, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness, but yet denying its power. From such people, turn away. For this sort are the type who creep into households and make captive gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as Janus and Jomres resisted Moses, so do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, and their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. So in this passage, okay, as, as we stop there, Paul is telling Timothy, and us by extension, that there were going to be these people that rise up in these last times. Now, he, he refers to the last days, okay? These days that, that are going to come, right? These last days, there will be difficult or perilous times. Now, when he's referring to these last days, I think he's referring to the period of time between when Christ ascended and his second coming, okay? As it gets closer to the second coming, we are closer and closer, and we are in these last days. And so as we read through this long list of evil characteristics, we need, we need to assume, you know, that he's talking about the time that we're living in right now, the last days. We are in that time right now. Now, as he lists off all these different evil things that people will do, you think, how in the world would these people ever darken the doors of a church? But if we were to assume that, we would be wrong. In verse 5, Paul tells us that they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. It's pretty wild to think, but the people that Paul is referring to, they're not outside of the church house. They can be within the church house. They are right here. They take the form of godliness, but yet they have denied its power. And so it's hard to think that it could be some of the people that teach Bible studies. It could be that they are, are even pastors in the pulpit, right? And so anyway, the idea is, is that they are people that uh, in reality are not genuinely walking with the Lord. And you see, God looks upon the heart. We may think that we're fooling everybody else, but God is one who looks upon the heart. And frankly, we don't really fool the world either. What's the one word that people on the outside of the church look into the church house and they say they're full of hypocrites, right? You hear that word so many times in relation to the church. So we think that we fool everybody, but the outside world looks in and says, you know what? The church is full of hypocrites. That's why I don't go to church. So friends, even though we think we're putting on a good front, many a times people will look into the church house and they can see our motives. They can see what is actually true. And so friends, here's what we have to do in light of this passage. We have to understand the danger of worldly religion. Okay, worldly religion is very dangerous. It harms our spiritual walk. And it distracts an unbelieving world. When they look into the church and they see hypocrisy, it distracts them. They don't want to come, come closer to Christ if they think that people that are hypocrites re resemble Christ or act like Christ, right? And so let's be honest for a second. It's really easy to fall into this trap of outwardly professing one thing, but inwardly living a different way. It's very easy to get into that trap. And so the reason that unbelievers often complain about hypocrites in the church is because, frankly, sometimes there are, right? It's not a truth that is unfounded. Sometimes I can be hypocritical, and I would venture to say that sometimes even you can be hypocritical. And so it's our job to look in the mirror and make sure that we're not one of the people that Paul is talking about. And so what's all striking to me in this passage is that uh, the people that Paul referenced, they thought themselves to be Christians. Paul's warning would have flown right over their head. They would have assumed that Paul wasn't talking to them. 
Or at the very least, if, if Paul said it directly to them, they would have protested and they would have said, no, 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 that's a gross character. That's not at all what I'm like. No, Paul, you have it wrong, right? So people wouldn't even recognize it. And that is the truth about hypocrisy. Have you ever noticed the Pharisees? The Pharisees very seldom knew that they were being hypocritical. Jesus taught to them and said it straight to their face over and over and over, but yet they never saw it. The Pharisees just never got it. And that is true with us. Many a times, hypocrites seldom recognize their own hypocrisy. So how can we sink that low? How can we as a people sometimes slump down into this issue of hypocrisy? Well, here's, here's the truth, okay? And if you're taking notes, you may want to write this down. In church life, many of us substitute an outward connection with the church for an inward connection with Christ. Did you catch that? Let me say it one more time. Many of people in the church substitute an outward connection with the church for an inward connection with Christ. We have swapped the two. We have conflated the two. You see, the people that Paul talked about, I have the idea that they went to church. They had a form of godliness, but yet they denied its power. You know what they were missing out on? They were missing out on Jesus himself. They were missing out on the real prize of our faith. And you see, I'm convinced that for many, you know, we go to church, but sometimes we miss communing with God himself. We think by just virtue of darkening the church doors that we've done something worthy, but that's not the case. It's not about your church attendance. It's about going to church to commune with the Lord, to make a connection with him. And so, friends, any time that, the, the, that uh, things are more about the place of worship rather than the person of worship, we have done something wrong. We have missed the point, and that's a dangerous place to be. Because when we're not seeking Christ, that's when our religion can get out of whack. You see, our, our religion starts to take the shape of that worldly religion that Paul talks about. And so I just want to talk for a moment, as we consider this worldly religion, as we're talking about how one can start with good intentions in the church, but kind of slump down into hypocrisy, slump down into this worldly religion, let me talk about how we get there. Because I don't think anybody goes to church thinking, I'm going to church because I want to be a hypocrite, right? Nobody walks into church with that intention at the start, but sometimes it can just subtly happen. So there's a way that I think that happens, okay? So here's, here's what I'd like to talk about. When we lose sight of the real treasure of the Christian life, Jesus himself, when we lose sight of that, two major things happen that bring us out of focus, okay? First of all, when you substitute outward religion for a meaningful relationship with Christ, you begin to have misplaced affections, misplaced affections, Listen here, I think it's abundantly clear in the passage, okay, and I don't think it's coincidence that the first two things that Paul states and the very last item on his list are all relating to misplaced affections. Notice in the passage there in verse 2, Paul said that they will be lovers of self and lovers of money. And then if you go on to verse 4, he ends that whole uh, passage by saying that they, ha they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so let's just talk about that, okay? Notice that it's all about a misplaced affection. So first you have this self-love, okay? Now generally speaking, we all do a pretty good job of loving ourselves, um, generally, okay? But sometimes that self-love gets out of control. See, when we love ourselves too much, the sins that start to seep in would be that, that greed, that selfishness, you know, where we're, we're seeking our own interests more than we seek others' interests, right? And so in the Bible, you won't find a single command in Scripture that teaches that we need to love ourselves more. It's just not there, which is kind of ironic because a lot of our self-help stuff will tell you you need to love yourself more, right? And so culture kind of tells you, you need to love yourself more, but Bible, the Bible says something different, that you need to love others more, okay? Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, let nothing be done 
out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than ourselves. Let each look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Or in Romans chapter 12, here's another way that Paul puts it. He says, uh, For I say through the grace given to me that everyone who is among you should not think more highly than they ought to think of themselves, but rather think soberly, as God has dealt with each one as a measure of faith. And so I'm not saying that we should hate ourselves. The Bible doesn't say that either. But what it does say is that we need to have a, a proper amount of that self-love. If it's, if it's um, amplified or if it's overextended, we get into a dangerous territory. So I think we have to put some guardrails around this idea of love for self. Because if we end up going too far down that hole, it becomes a dangerous trap. And the bottom line is, if we're consumed only with self, how can we be consumed with Christ? Right? Let that sink in. If we're only consumed with ourself, how can we be consumed with Christ? He goes on to the second misplaced affection, the love of money. Now, frankly, this flows out of self-love, right? At the end of the day, if we love ourselves, then we will love money a tad too much because we see it as a means to live a comfortable lifestyle. And so hear me on this. I'm not saying that money itself is evil, right? But the love of money is evil, right? It's the love of it. You see, when money is used well, it's a powerful tool for Christ and his kingdom. But yet... When we have misplaced priorities, things start to get out of balance. You see, I've seen Christians be generous, and it was used for great good. But on the same token, I've seen when that Christianity gets a little messed up. And so, friends, it's perfectly fine to have some money, to spend some money, to save some money, as long as your giving is in proportion. You see, Jesus said that the money is an indicator of your heart. Did you ever think about that? What did Jesus say? Where your treasure is, your heart is also, right? Where your treasure is, your heart is also. So Jesus is teaching. He says, listen, the, if you look at somebody's uh, bank account, so to speak, if you look at their bank statement at the end of the month, that's a good indicator of what you love. Where's the money going to? If it's only going for self, then where's the affection for Christ, right? So money is part of this too. You see, if, if all of it goes for our selfish wants and our desires, but it never fuels the work that God has in the world, then there's an issue because we've exchanged our love for money as opposed to our love for Christ. Then the last thing that Paul mentions in this is he says that uh, the love of pleasure can be a, a dilemma. And see, that's tough, isn't it? Because the world around us offers us so many things that captures the apple of our eye. You ever think about that? Culture is always inundating ourselves with the idea of pleasure. Just indulge in this. You deserve it, right? And you'll, you'll see that even in our commercials. You hear the phrase, you only live once. Why not, you know? Go ahead, get that shampoo. Your hair deserves it, right? And so anyway, with this constant barrage of indulging and indulging and indulging in whatever our heart desires and wants, we start to slip into this rabbit hole of loving pleasure rather than loving God. Now, what I'm about to say might surprise you, okay? It's not wrong to pursue pleasure. Hear me on that. I see a couple eyebrows raising. It's not wrong to pursue pleasure, but what's wrong is when we pursue pleasure outside of the Lord. Does that make sense? That's where we go wrong. As Christians, the Bible teaches us that we have access to the fullness of joy, the fullness of joy, right? Everything that we have or everything that we need to be joyful and abundant is in the Lord. We don't have to look to other things to give us pleasure because we have the Lord, right? Nothing that this world has to offer will ever compare to the beauty and the matchless worth of just knowing Christ. If we just know him, we can find all the pleasure that our heart ever needs because Jesus is more than enough. He's more than enough. So we have to caution ourselves in these areas, right? We have to caution ourselves on self-love. 
We have to caution ourselves with the love of money, and we have to caution ourselves with the love of pleasure. And think of them in this way. Let me give you a great illustration here. Okay, imagine that I had up here with me a, a glass, okay, a simple glass, one that you can see through, okay, and on each side of the glass, you have two pitchers that you could be filling your glass with, okay, one pitcher is filled with dark content, okay, it's that self-love gone wrong, it's that money that we love way too much, it's that pleasure that we indulge in over and over, and the other is a clear liquid, that represents Christ being poured into our life, okay? Imagine that you have this cup. There's only so much capacity in this cup, but as you start to pour from that pitcher with the dark liquid, that cup starts to fill, and it's darker and darker and darker. And you know what's interesting about that analogy? You only have so much that you can fill yourself with. There's a limit to that cup. Anything that you mix in from the world is less room that you can mix in for Christ. Isn't that true? And you know what? You can't just have a little bit of Christ in a lot of the world because will Christ be seen beyond all that black in that cup? Not very much. The world will still see a dark cup, a black cup full of love for self, love for money, and love for pleasure, right? And so all that to say, we have to realize there's only so much that we can fill inside of this glass. And just like that glass, people can see into it. The world outside looks in, and we think we have them fooled, but they'll see what's in the cup. They'll see what's in the cup. They'll know the motives of our heart and the intentions of our heart. And then what's interesting is, at uh, Paul transition, he talks about uh, kind of this, this uh, misplaced affection, but then notice he lists all of these different sins that come along with those misplaced affections, right? In verses one through four, notice he says, uh, in the last days, perilous times will come. Uh, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And then look at the list of stuff that comes along with all this. They're, they're boasters, they're proud, they're blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So what's interesting is as we fill our cup with all of that self-love, money for self, or uh, sorry, love for money, love for self, and love for pleasure, what happens when our cup gets bumped? Okay, if, if my cup was filled with only that dark liquid and people are seeing in and they're seeing that love for self, love for pleasure, love for money, when somebody bumps my cup, what's going to come out of it? The black liquid, right? Right? Only what you have in the cup will come out. And so all that to say, I think Paul is trying to get us to, to understand that what is inside of us, what's inside of our heart, it will inevitably spill out for everybody to see, right? And so Paul is saying what comes from these three misplaced affections pours out in our words and in our deeds because that's what's inside of us. That's what we filled our cup with. And so it, it's no wonder that all these other things that Paul says comes out because we filled our heart with bad things, with evil things. And so People will, one, look inside our cup and see what we have inside of us, but when we bump into them, when we run into them in life, it'll also come out in the things that we say and the things that we do. Man, our words will find us out. And so, friends, as often as we think that we do a good job of masking any hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisy that we have, the reality is we don't. People can see right through that curtain. They can see the intentions of our heart. And the actions that we do and the words that we say bear truth to what we've poured inside of our heart. And so here's what we need to do with our sermon this morning. I would suggest that we have to reflect on our own personal glass. What have you poured into your cup? Have you poured from the pitcher of self-love, of you know, love for money, uh, love for pleasure? Have we exchanged all of these things over and above loving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? Or have we poured from the pitcher of Christ that he's enough, that he's everything that we need, and that we've poured him into ourselves so that when the world looks at us,
they see more of Christ and less of me? That's the question we have to ask this morning. What is your cup filled with? And so maybe this morning, maybe we have to empty that glass. If we've poured all of this bad junk into our glass, maybe we need to empty it and start over. Do you know what it, what it looks like to empty that glass? Here's what I think it looks like. I think it means that we have to humble ourselves in broken repentance and ask God to help us start over again. If we have been hypocritical in the Christian life, we have to confess it. We have to just say, God, I've messed this thing up. Would you please break me and use me for your glory and your good? And then if you allow him to empty that glass, empty that cup of all that nasty stuff that we've stored away in our heart, we can start fresh and allow Christ to start pouring into us instead. And I'll tell you what, when we start to do that, when we're broken before the Lord and we ask for him to start changing our heart, when that actually happens, the world's going to start to take note because they can see what's inside of our cup. They'll recognize that change in us. If we put away that hypocrisy, if we put away all that nasty stuff that we've mixed in and we've exchanged this for Christ, if we do that, the world will look and they won't think that we have a worldly religion. They'll recognize that, man, there's some alignment here. There's something that has happened in this person's uh, heart where what they say, what they believe you know, what they do, everything is in perfect alignment with each other. And man, the world will take notice. So let him, let Christ be the object of your desires. Let him be the object of your affection. And let him be the source of your pleasure and your joy. And if we can do that, we can safeguard against having this worldly religion that does damage not only to ourselves, but it does damage to the cause of Christ. So friends, reflect this morning and ask yourselves, what have you poured into your cup? And is it time to empty that cup and start over and ask God to start pouring more of himself into you rather than all of these other things that we've exchanged for the joy of knowing Christ? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning as we reflect on the message. Heavenly Father, as we take a moment just to think about this message today, we pray, Lord, that we would have more of you and less of everything else. Lord, this world that we live in, it's so simple to get hung up in all of these things that we talked about today. Paul gives us a, a very uh, shrewd warning. He says, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure over God. Lord, as we think of that, it's so simple for Mitch Tabla to slip into those traps. And Lord, it's so simple for each person here to do the same. Sometimes the world is so distracting that we, we slip down into the rabbit hole and there we go. We're stuck in it again. And so, Father, I pray if there's anybody here today that, that resonates with this message, that does an honest assessment of what they've poured into their own personal cup, whatever is in their heart. I pray, Lord, if there's any of us here today that has exchanged the love of what the world has to offer in exchange for the love of Christ, I pray, Lord, that you would empty that cup this morning. That, Lord, we would come to you in broken repentance and that, Lord, we would ask you to fill us with more of you rather than everything else that the world has to offer us. And that, Lord, when people look inside of Valpo Baptist, that, Lord, they would see no hypocrisy, that they would see no, uh, you know, unsteadiness of our character, but, Lord, that we would be steadfast, loving you with our whole heart, our, all of our strength, all of our mind, and that, Lord, when they see us, we would be a reflection of Christ rather than the world. And so, Father, we pray that for this church. We pray that for each person here today. And, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to help us to do that. And so, Lord, if we need to do any changing today, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would so grab our heart that before we walk out the doors today, that, Lord, you would do something uh, in our hearts so that we would purpose our lives in a different way, that, Lord, we would, we would come to you in broken repentance 
and change what needs to be changed. And so, Father, we love you so much. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Real quickly, before we dismiss, a couple quick things. Um, one, right after service, we will have our quarterly business meeting. So it's that time. It's June, so it's time to go ahead and start doing that. So we encourage you to stick around if you can for that business meeting. Hopefully it won't be terribly long, but we would love your support to help us do that. And then also, as Rachel uh, had said in her announcements, I want to double down on the fact that we're starting a collection for paper pantry items. Please take a look at that paper at the info desk and see how you can donate, be a part of that. You know, one thing that we get quite often here at the church is people calling asking for help. And so one way that we can help people for the long term is to be able to deliver these paper pantry items to them. You see, we can't pay everybody's NIPSCO bill each and every month. But what we can do is we can offer these simple items that everybody needs on an ongoing basis. And what that does is rather than a one-time touch, we can say, you know what? Why don't you come back every month and we will fulfill any items you need from toothpaste to deodorant to shampoos and conditioners and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what that does is it allows us to have a lasting ministry in people's lives. So I encourage you, if you can help us donate to get that started, just take a look on the desk and please help us do that. All right. So we'll see you at the business meeting in just a minute.